building service offers design services for locations in federal buildings or spaces that they lease. And finally, there's a furniture and finishings category called Comprehensive Furniture Management Services as part of MAS, where using a performance work surface, you can solicit to a number of designers. Next to talk about what is already covered in the multiple award schedule. So if an item is on GSA schedule, then it already meets some very stringent requirements, such as the ANSI BIFMA uh, panel of requirements that deal with office chairs, filing, lounges and public seating, and other types of storage pieces. These standards are intended to be a common basis for evaluating the safety and durability and structural adequacy of office furniture. They have a 10-year estimated product warranty. However, most of the products are put to a higher standard than their warranties offer, which is very helpful in, in selecting these furniture pieces. Um, along with a lot of those standards that are covered in there, there are also some weight requirements for seating. So a lot of this can be avoided as duplication in our other standards. Floor plans and typicals. In order for you to have a requirement that's ready to go out for, for bid, you would have had to have a floor plan drawn up or designed. So a lot of the pieces that you have are already ready to go, knowing how many stations you would need or how many private offices. However, those are not part of the bid package. In an effort to streamline all of our services, not just for the bidders, but also for the evaluators, we want to give them just a snapshot of what they will be procuring. And that is why we offer a typical, usually with a quantity of one. What the typical does is it outlines the workstation and the parts of pieces that, are, that make up that workstation. In this case, in the, in the center example, you'll see some, some wall panels, some work surfaces, as well as some storage pieces. And this will comprise one unit. Now, obviously, in your floor plan, this unit would most likely be next to another unit. And in order to save that time of counting up panels, which can be very time consuming, we want the quarters to just quote the one unit. Now, there's a cost savings that we're losing by that. It's about 20%. But what this does is it buys us some flexibility for when we're picking finishes, if maybe a finish is a little more expensive than others, or if there's pieces in the procurement that have been missed, such as we needed additional lateral files or an additional table. So that kind of gives us a cushion to play with to not exceed the original budget. Um, the typicals that we use are for workstations and for private offices. So on the th example to the right, you'll see a very similar situation where there may be 10 units, 10 offices, and they'll all have a general layout that's similar to this. If there's something, maybe a column in the way, we'll still use this layout. Unless it's a completely different layout, then we would use a different type of typical. Typically, we like to keep the number of typicals down. Um, even if there's windows or something like that that would interfere with some of the panels, they'll take that into consideration during final design. Now we get into actually defining the requirement. To start, in order for them to, in order for the vendors to properly quote, they need as much information as possible, specifically when it comes to services. So there are many building requirements that are necessary up front to give them as much information as possible. For instance, does your building require additional security clearances? When is the building accessible for installation? What are the floors affected? The sizes of lighting, light loading docks, freight elevators, and door heights and ceiling heights are all very important. For instance, if they need to access a second or third floor and have no access to an elevator, that'll require the manufacturers to have their installation people stair carry these items that can often be very heavy or cumbersome. They will obviously need to account for that when they're doing their installation calculations. So the more information we can give them up front, the closer to a perfect number we can get. Now we actually get into the nitty gritty of the furniture. Um, you know, the one thing about furniture is that for as complex and complicated as it can be, there are many portions that are very straightforward. For instance, when it comes to workstation panels, they all, all the vendors and all the manufacturers have pretty traditional styles of widths. In other words, they all come in increments of three to six inches. Same thing similarly to storage. Everyone has a two high lateral file. Everyone has a three high lateral. Everyone has a four high lateral. They all come in 36, 42, 48. So when we talk about things like that, that makes our life a little bit easier because we're not checking to the nth degree whether everybody can offer those pieces. 
it does get a little complicated when we talk about heights of panels and things like that. So these are the points that we're going to focus on today. Uh, for instance, panel heights are really important in deciding what type of space you have, whether you need standing privacy, which is more on the lines of a 65 to 68 inch high panel, a more traditional seated privacy, 48 inches to 54 inches high. If it's more of an open plan or a collaborative space, it would be 40 to 42 inches. And then if it's even lower, needing more of a transaction counter feel, it would be 34 to 36 inches. So these kind of start to dictate, you know, what type of space you have. And of course, all this is done with the designers. These are just kind of transferring those messages to the vendors to, to get what we really want out of it. Um, we follow up with panel toppers. This is another very important portion. Um, unfortunately, not all the vendors offer a similar product. Some of them offer various options or various types or styles. Um, they do all offer a framed and a frameless variety. The frameless would just sit right on top of the panel itself. The framed would actually be integrated into the panels and kind of have a kind of frame around the actual panel that would sit on top of that panel. The issues come in when we're asking for things like glass or acrylic. In order to open up competition and make it as competitive as possible, we like to not leave that in the equation because many vendors only offer one or the other, but not necessarily both. However, they will still give you the desired look that you're looking for. Um, with work surfaces, some are, uh, some are stationary as your traditional work surface can be, but many are adju have adjustable height features which are great for you know, standing up or stretching your legs and having a different kind of view. Um, other pieces that are different are the overhead storages, whether it's flipper door versus sliding door. Sliding door is a traditional door that just slides left to right. A flipper door actually opens up and allows you to see what's inside. Um, and finally, in the workstations, we talk about the, the towers. Um, the traditional wardrobe tower is about a nine to 15 inch wardrobe that has a single door that opens up with a coat hook or coat rod just for storing a coat. Uh, the combination storage incorporates that, but also has another portion that would have a bookcase or a storage cabinet above and then filing below, either a box file or file file. And last, there's a, a pullout tower where the entire tower pulls out almost allowing you a little bit of privacy from your neighbor if there's no separation otherwise. Other types of typicals we do are benching typicals. These are kind of more for open office areas where there's not a, there's more collaborative space and not a lot of uh, definition of space. Um, we offer, usually we uh, offer a single or a double, which would be a back-to-back. -back. And these can obviously come in runs of one, two or three or two, four, six, um, whatever the space requires. Um, we covered a little bit on private offices previously in some of the presentations earlier and the difference between transitional and traditional. Traditional is a more robust offering, kind of very decorative, almost something you would see in judges chambers or kind of uh, government officials, that level of furniture. It's usually a solid wood product that's, that's very hefty as opposed to more of a transitional look, which is more of a sleek, um, thinner panels, but all case good variety. And then last but not least, there's accessories that go into making all these stations, whether they're task lighting, keyboard trays, monitor arms, or power modules. One of the more difficult things to cover is seating, mainly because there's so many different options. Um, for instance, the basic task seating that everyone's been mentioning comes in a mid back or a high back, um, has many ergonomic features such as height adjustability, seat pan depth adjustment, adjustable lumbar support, tilting, as well as uh, movable arms, whether it's height width or pivot adjustment. Um, even to, to up that one, Auntie, there's also a heavy duty task chart that's more for a 24 seven seating situation. Um, there's a robust offering of guest seating, whether it be metal or wood for leg, or even just a sled base option. Um, training seating, and the major option with the training seating is that the seat can flip or nest, which allows the, tr allows the seat to be stored easily. Um, usually most training rooms are configurable for different settings, whether it be you know just seating or seating in tables or just an open area. So this allows you the flexibility to do some of those things. Um, the cafe seating for you know your break rooms or things like that comes in many varieties, uh, specifically the, the height of the chair, your standard height versus your counter height or your bar height to offer different levels of seating and to offer just a little more, um, more help for your designers to get the look that they're looking for. Uh, within seating, the lounge seating or soft seating has many, many other capabilities, which is kind of what also makes it complicated. Um, the single seat 
two seat or three seat lounge sofa for reception stations or open areas. Uh, that single seat can sometimes come with a tablet arm. Uh, with there is a reclining lounge chair that's used for lactation rooms. Um, the big thing with this is that it has a bleach cleanable fabric and that it reclines so you have some adjustability. Um, and then a loud serpentine seating, which is more of a modular look uh, offered in inside and outside wedges, as well as straight pieces to give you some S curves or some to create more uh, intimate spaces for, for smaller conversations. Those are also available with or without a back. And lastly, a very popular uh, private lounge workstation, which has become a sort of a touchdown station for people who want to come in and, and, you know, have some privacy while they're working, which, which has a higher panel of about 48 to 56 inches um, while still being part of the community. Um, the, the added features to that is usually comes with a writing surface or some storage if you're touching down for the day, as well as power uh, to be included for your laptop or your phones. Um, similarly to chairs, tables also has a robust offering when you're selecting your, your pieces. Um, the most traditional one is the conference room table. Uh, comes in many different top sizes, the most common being rectangular or an ellipse or oval. Um, the base types on these, it can be a, a single column base or a dual column base if necessary, a drum base or a panel look to give you many options for the kind of style you want to show in your space. Uh, the collaborative media table is another one that's become very popular um, recently as it kind of gives you a little touchdown area in an open space for a few people. Um, it's usually built on with one flat su surface and then one rounded surface. The flat surface usually either has a cabinet or a wall mounted to be able to, to mount a television. So you can plug in your HDMI cables and, and be able to present right to your group right there in a small setting, uh, usually in a very open environment. And then your traditional occasional tables, which are nothing more than your coffee tables or your end tables, again, for your um, reception spaces or your open area lounge spots. Cafe tables in line with the cafe chairs that we talked about earlier come in three heights, a standard height, a counter height, and a bar height, also in different shapes, rectangular, square, or round, depending on what your space requires. And similarly to that, the training table also functions in the same way that the training chair functioned, also with flip nest capabilities, with locking casters, so that these can be moved around and adjusted to the way you need, the, need them for the space, with an optional modesty panel that can also uh, flip and nest so that when it folds down, it folds down flat. Um, and then some traditional laptop tables just for use with a, a lot of the lounge seating or a lot of the soft seating. Now, there are so many other things that we could cover in this very short time. Um, for instance, we offer high density filing uh, for large storage areas, um, technical workbenches for more of, um, you know, electronic work that needs to be um, electrically charged, AV credenzas for conference rooms, industrial shelving for, you know, heavy, heavy duty shelving, uh, like almost to the point of pallet racks and things like that. Lockers for your employees for when they come in at the beginning of the day to put their things away. Uh, tack boards and marker boards to be able to present in a conference room. And last but not least, privacy screens, which have become very important, especially in these days uh, post COVID and things like that, to be able to create separation of space when necessary. Now, there are many things that we cannot accommodate. And I'll go over the list of what these, a lot of these items are that we get asked for many times and kind of give you some of the reasons why these are sort of not possible. Uh, for instance, we can't handle outdoor furniture or clocks, uh, waste receptacles, any electronics like monitors, printers, or even appliances like dishwashers and refrigerators, uh, general office supplies, um, markers and erasers, even though these would go with marker boards and tack boards and things like that, we can't provide them. Um, ceiling track room dividers, uh, plumbing fixtures, coat hangers, and door mounted coat hooks. Um, a lot of the reasons why we can't do these things are, are vary. For instance, we don't wanna put anything in the space that can easily walk away, such as waste receptacles, office supplies, things like that. Uh, I feel like we'd be replenishing these very frequently. Um, things like outdoor furniture, a lot of those get mounted directly into the concrete or into the floor. Things like that are kind of outside the purview of things that we would want to incorporate into the, into the installation portions of it. Um, electronics and appliances and plumbing fixtures for obvious reasons, a lot of these manufacturers manufacturers don't have those on their contracts. They would have to team with another company in order to provide those. And while some of the things on the left they do team with, um, those are still within the realm of office furniture, while a lot of those fall sort of out of bounds. Um, 
then something like door mounted coat hooks, something that would need to be installed onto a piece of furniture that's not part of our furniture. Um, a lot of these things need to be wall mounted or or um, wall anchored or reinforced in some way. And that sort of is acceptable. It's when we're kind of taking things that are just kind of almost accessories and trying to incorporate that into there where we kind of want to respect the, the general contractor and they would be the ones to be able to put it in whoever was building the space out. Um, one of the features that has really come into play as of late has been electrical requirements. Um, we're seeing this more and more in, in all our spaces. Um, obviously, there's places that you would expect to see them in the workstation panels or in the benching panels. Um, with things like that, we need to be aware of how the building is getting fed, whether the building is taking a base feed or whether it's going to be ceiling fed through power poles. The important thing to remember about these portions is that the connection from the furniture to the building is handled by the electrician by the general contractor. So that is not done by the furniture vendors at all. The furniture vendors are required to run the wiring through all the panels. So that is their part, but that, that connection to the actual building is done by the electrician. Um, oftentimes they'll send all of those base feeds and those power poles ahead of time before the furniture arrives so that they can start making some of those connections so that when they come in, it's just the plug and play. But that's an important thing to remember. Um, when we actually get to the space itself, the important thing to think about is how many receptacles do you really need? There are so many places where you don't think that there are outlets that you really need. Obviously, you need an outlet for the computer, for the monitors, for desk lighting. Something like the adjustable height work surface needs a, needs a power plug to, to function if it's electric. Um, now your employees and your people are going to need phone chargers, uh, even printers at their spaces and things like that. So it's important to remember that, you know, more outlets is probably the better bet. And the also the important thing to remember is that the adjustable height work surfaces um, usually should come with a surface mounted module. Um, when you're plugging in things that are going to be on that adjustable height work surface that need to go up and down, it's important that the plug is right there and will go up and down with you. If you're plugging it into a wall outlet or a panel outlet, that could get pulled or, or pushed in a certain way if, if you're pulling the adjustable height too high. So it's important to be able to plug into something lower and then have that plug in at which will be more static. Um, obviously, conference room tables are something that have traditionally had power requirements to them. There's typically a recessed power module, which includes power and USB and HDMI to plug into any televisions or projectors in the space. So those are pretty much well known. Uh, the training tables function similar to the adjustable height, where they would have a surface mounted uh, outlet for power and USB. Um, again, since most of the rooms that those training rooms are going into are reconfigurable, it's important that they don't just have the ability to plug into a floor box, but that they can be daisy chained to be plugged into each other if the floor box is now too far away from where you ultimately want to plug those in. Obviously, if you're having a training course or something like that, you'd need a laptop and most likely the laptop would need to be charged again, as well as your cell phone and things like that. Um, and then again, where we're kind of trying to see more things happening is with occasional tables and things like that, where, you know, everyone is using these open areas, these, you know, for collaborative spaces, and but they always need a place to plug in at the end of the day. Um, because they're using their laptops or their tablets or their phones. Um, so that's important to provide them a space like that. Um, similarly to that, seating is now becoming a hot button issue. All of our lounge seating is usually coming with some sort of power module to be able to plug in your outlets, to be able to plug in your phones when you're not working from your desk to make your life a little bit easier. Um, the big, uh, the, we're ending with finishes because this is a very important topic. Um, you know, once the designers get started and they start picking their wall finishes and their floor finishes, it's hard not to keep going. It's hard not to say, oh, we have the perfect paint color and we have the perfect flooring. Let's start picking our, our seating for our seating fabrics or our panel fabrics for that. And a lot of times we run 100 miles per hour and have everything selected. Unfortunately, at this stage of the game, pre-award, we don't know which vendor is going to be the ultimate winner. So we don't know if that vendor is going to be able to use a lot of those selections. So it's important to kind of pick the pieces that are important up front 
and then save the pieces at the end. At that point, you'll be working with, a, with a, one of the designers from the vendor, and they'll be able to tell you exactly what's possible, exactly what's going to go with your flooring, exactly what's going to go with your, with your wall finish, but also what's going to be available quickly. We're dealing with a lot of supply chain issues and a lot of fabrics are discontinued or, or hard to get. So things like picking a fabric that you know isn't super accessible now could increase your wait time for the products by 10 to 12 weeks. So it's important to kind of pace, pace yourself and kind of see what's available now by the professionals that are, that are actually manufacturing it. Um, so the pieces that we're looking for pre-award are, we're looking for the workstation panel material, whether that's gonna be a fabric, a laminate, or a metal. Um, the workstation topper panels, are they gonna be clear or are they gonna be frosted? The work surface and tabletop material, is it laminate or is it veneer? A storage material, we have a lot of options here. We can do metal, laminate, or veneer, depending on where it's going, whether it's going in a workstation, or a private office with veneer. Um, so that's important to remember that there are a lot of options for that. Uh, the modesty or privacy panels, is it going to be frosted? Is it going to be fabric or laminate? Seating materials come in upholstery, plastic, wood, and seating upholstery, uh, whether it's fabric, whether it's mesh, whether it's vinyl, whether it's leather. So those are the things that are important pre-award. And then post-award, once we've selected a once we've selected an awardee and you're able to work with the designers, that's when you're going to pick all your finishes. Um, you're going to be taking a look at your laminates, whether they're solid, pattern, or wood wood grain, uh, veneers, your species or your finish, uh, the metals, whether the, what color the paint is going to be on those metals. Uh, plastics usually has an abundant amount of colors to choose from. And lastly, your fabric, mesh, vinyl, and leather for the finishes. And they're going to work with you. They're going to have this all the samples that you need to see, all the, you know, the laminate chips, all the fabric swatches. They're going to have everything for you. And that when they come to, to do that meeting to, to set up whether they're going to do their uh, dimensioning and things like that. Um, so that covers my talk on understanding the requirements. Well, thank you so much, Carlos. That was a lot of great information. And who would have thought, I mean, honestly, from somebody that doesn't, again, purchase um, sure at all, um, that there are so many requirements that go into it. So really, I want to thank you for that information. And I'm going to go ahead and we had some questions. So let me go ahead and pull those up and see if we can get a few of those answered. Just one second here. I think we had uh, Dawn doing some answers uh, live. Oh, perfect, perfect. So um, Dawn, thank you for that. You really made that, made it great. Um, right now, the open questions are clear. The queue is clear. Okay, perfect. Um, so you're yeah, off Carlos. the hook, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dawn. Off the hook. So we appreciate that. And again, all of those questions and answers will be posted to the website after the event. So please go ahead and follow us on the website and, uh, and do look to that to have those, those question and answers posted. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it back over to Mary. Um, going to see if we have a couple of poll questions or any other information to share. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dana. We do have a poll, and this is one of those polls that um, we really want to give Carlos some feedback via a quick poll. So I'm going to launch it. And that is, we're going to ask you, what is your level of expertise in procuring furniture? Are you an expert? I organize and fulfill major remodels with furniture projects. Intermediate, I'm currently working on a furniture requirement. Novice, have not done it, but I may be working on it in the next 12 months and none of the above or not applicable to my role. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of time here. We're getting to that 50% marker. You know, I love it when I get at least 50% of you answering these polls. So that's a good thing. Um, yay, we passed 50%. And I am going to end the poll and share the results. It looks like we have about 12% of you that are experts, 19% of you that are intermediate, currently working on something, 40% of you that are novice, 
but could be working on something. And 29% that said not applicable to the role or none of the above. Um, just for you novices out there, we will take that into consideration. There's some things that we can share with the furniture category. We'll let them know who you are. And we'll also be taking that in consideration as we move towards next year, because we really do want to make this very complex uh, category a much, much easier. And there's so many great resources. So I'm gonna stop sharing. You can feel free to close out your polls if they're on your screen. And next up, we have a session for you that will be really helpful. Um, and if you have, if time is something that you're focused on when you're doing your requirements development, you're gonna like this one a lot. Do you ever ask yourself, furniture procurement, how much time do I need? Well, we have two supervisory contracting officers, Laura Tadai and Annette Lang here to help all of you understand and tell us about how to manage that question. So with that, take it away, Annette and Laura. Thanks, Mary. Laura, can you see the screen? I think I'm sharing. Yes. Okay, yes, cool. you are. We're good. Thank you. Okay. So thanks again, Mary. Um, so I think this is a million dollar question uh, for everyone who goes through this process. So I hope that we can give you some insight and help you through your process um, as you are, rep are presented with questions that we all have in buying furniture. Okay, so some of the topics that we're going to discuss today um, is going to be, you know, letting you know how much time you can expect for each of these. Um, as Carlos just took you through the furniture um, design and requirements process, it seems as though that would definitely be a lengthy process. Uh, and then we'll move on to the RFQ process, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And we'll just give you um, some some tips to uh, to mark as important for that. And then we'll go through the time allotted for the technical and the price evaluations and some items for your contract award. And then the most important step after the contract award is the final bill of materials and um, the design process that happens. Uh, and then we will touch upon the manufacturing, delivery and installation, and I'm sure that's a hot topic for, for today. And then we'll um, recap with some, some lessons learned for you. So just to put a few things in perspective, um, Gaines' presentation earlier this afternoon uh, for the excess personal property um, went over you know, the availability of, of that. And then in comparison with Chris's NSN presentation, um, you can just see basically with the exception of systems furniture, um, it would be readily available and um, if very efficient uh, for those specific items. And Annette and I will be covering the uh, office furniture and systems furniture um, for the most part under the GSA multiple award schedules program. And now for the furniture designs requirements. Um, now I'm going to start from the beginning at, as far as the agreements go. And this will go back to uh, what Carlos had stated for the design requirements. If you have a design team in house or not, or if you're using a third, um, a third party or if it's contracted out, um, if you're doing an assisted acquisition, you would most likely be completing an interagency agreement and that comes in two parts. The first part is, is the basis of the agreement between the agencies. And then the second part, which is the, the part B, uh, consists of all the funding information and, and that includes uh, treasury account symbols and things of that nature. 
So if you are doing something that is an assisted acquisition, you will most definitely be doing that. And some agencies often um, use, it's a 7600A and a 7600B. And there are um, templates and things out there that you would be able to research and utilize as samples. Then you would be doing your market research. Um, I do want to point out um, as we go through the slides, you'll see a timeline and it'll reflect where we are talking through the process. Um, so you may be doing an R5 for your, um, for your requirement. You may need to define your vendor pool and then determine where you are going to solicit. So you may be doing an R5 and eBuy um, to get your interested parties and all of that information will be gathered in your acquisition plan. Um, I know a lot of times we try to, you know, expedite the, ex the acquisition plan, excuse me, um, but you definitely want to a lot and a sufficient amount of time to gather all that information and input it and submit it to the proper approval levels per your agency. Um, the next step would be, you know, having your furniture requirements. We always have a statement of work and that statement of work includes everything that Carlos covered. Your um, product, uh, your products that you're going to require what the specific, uh, the specifications rather are of each product, the quantities of that product, um, and it will have the customer agency information as well in that. Um, so that is definitely what you want to have as concrete as possible. Um, and also your furniture design will go in, go into that and create um, the information that goes into the statement of work. In that process, uh, the government estimate will be create it. And you will need that whether you're doing this um, in-house. And if you are doing it in-house, in it would be, you know, you want to consider your resources. Um, I know a lot of things are in flux right now. Um, so it's definitely something to consider. And if you are doing it as an assisted acquisition and you are, you know, submitting funding to GSA, for example, for, for a procurement, things you want to consider are building in a little bit of time for that transition of funds. Because I think we can all attest that, you know, if there's one block on one form that has something and it needs to be changed, it needs to go back to the original person, it'll need to be initialed and okayed re and reviewed um, by the people that are, you know, accepting the form. So we just want to make sure that it's not, you know, just one day <laughs> in your timeline um, to, to account for that. And sometimes at the end, um, you don't wanna have something that you had forgotten and you need to, to go back and, uh, and address. And the other, the last item for this um, would be for your estimate. If you are doing that and there is a fee for service, you wanna include that in your estimate as well. Okay, so now moving on to the RFQ process. The, the system that you'll be using um, to solicit, you just want to ensure that there's access. Um, I know a lot of times we have RFIs and we, we let you know where to look for the RFQ when it is released. Um, so that's just something to remember. When you're writing your RFQ, sometimes uh, there is a free quote conference call. It is optional. I feel as though if you have a very complex um, requirement, it may be a good idea to do that. So you can highlight the most important parts of the RFQ. Um, but like I said, it's optional. If we, if you have something that is um, a little more straightforward, um, that is most likely something that you won't need to, to account for in your timeline. And the other major part that we would definitely recommend having is your question and answer period. Uh, upon release of the RFQ, we would literally, um, allow for, we would give a due date um, in the RFQ and allow for the vendors to review the requirements, gather their questions. And this is really the time when it's crucial that the details are, uh, are accurate as, as much as physically possible, because this is the time when they can ask a follow-up question and you have the opportunity to go back to the customer or go back to the, your technical expert and say, you know, this is the question what what can we do, what needs to be changed? And if there is a change that needs to be made, you would 
amend your statement of work instead of finding out after the fact, after the quotes come in and you have um, a bid or a quote that you know does not meet the requirement and you're gonna have more time that it's going to take you after the fact than uh, addressing it during the Q&A period when your RFQ is open. So it presents that opportunity. And also it's the opportunity just to ensure that everybody's on a level playing field because every single vendor interested that has the RFQ will receive the same information. Um, even if a vendor does not submit a question, they will be able to see every question that was submitted with the answers. And often um, we do have you know, questions that are submitted late. It is in your best interest and the government's best interest to, to answer those questions um, because they're, you know, they were asked for a reason. Uh, so you just wanna make sure that you're addressing everything and uh, that would avoid it issues post-award. And one other common request is extensions. A lot of times we have um, our answers, we try to give the vendors at least five business days. This way they can review the answers and if there were any changes and address that in their, in their quotes accordingly and make the necessary changes. So we wanna make sure they have ample time to, to address those as well. And then, okay, so I'm going to go over, um, Annette will be addressing the price evaluation. So I'm going to take you through the, the technical evaluation. Um, and it may include these, uh, the technical compliance management plan and past performance. Now, these are not the only factors, um, but these are, I feel like the most common ones. So we want to, the, the technical compliance we always have, it's basically for, from the statement of work, each of the items are compared and making, ensuring that the quote accommodates that requirement. So the typicals would be included as well. And um, Carlos had addressed the typicals, the bill of materials, the parts and pieces, each one of those it's very, very detailed. And the finishes, like he said, would be addressed post-award The um, and the dimensions of the items are obviously mo most important to ensure that they're meeting the requirement. The management plan and the past performance, uh, you would be able to um, indicate in your RFQ what you're requiring for each of those. Um, so it depends on how your evaluation, you're evaluating um, that and how much, how many people you have how <laughs> contributing to the effort. So you wanna have your um, time set aside for this. And also the, I think Jim Boyle had referenced this that basically I would say nine point seven, five, at least out of 10 times, you will not be awarding on initials, even though we would love to do that. Uh, we almost always have a round of discussions. So that being said, you just want to have a realistic time frame because if you're not accounting for that, then you're already going to be behind within, within your evaluation. You haven't even made it um, to the award phase yet. So we always want to have time for that because the deficiencies that are identified within the quotes, you have to, you know, allow the time for the vendors to review that. If it's something very simple and it can be turned around within a day or two, that's that's great. But sometimes there's um, there's issues that are, you know, more extensive. So you want to give them enough time to change their their quote accordingly to what you're providing them, and then obviously you don't need to um, reevaluate those those portions. And we do recommend, um, you know, requesting that those changes are highlighted. It makes for a little bit of a more efficient process once you get the quotes back. Um, so I th think that, you know, as long as you're including um, time within that and you're not assuming that you're going to be awarding on initials, uh, that's, a, that's a good place to, to be. So I'm gonna turn it over to Annette um, to take us through to the price evaluation portion.
Okay, thanks, Laura. I'm just getting myself unmuting myself and putting my video on. Okay, here we go. All right, so Laura touched on the um, technical evaluation aspect, which piggybacks a lot on what Carlos had talked about, detailing specifications. The second um, piece of that is the price evaluation. And um, we spend a lot of time going through just basically checking um, the GSA catalogs um, to make sure that the pricing offered is correct. Um, as Jim Boyle mentioned um, in his presentation at the beginning of the, of the afternoon, we typically will award based on lowest price technically acceptable. And more often than not, um, our awards do come down to price because we get with our, um, with our vendors to the point where we have more than one that are technically acceptable after one or two rounds of discussions. And so it does boil down to price. So we wanna make sure that the pricing that we see is correct. Um, to do that, you would look at the GSA catalogs and match up and make sure that the pieces and parts that they're quoting um, match the pricing that's offered in their catalogs. Um, it is up to you um, to make your life easier. As many of you know, furniture pricing can change every couple of months. Um, and so we will typically, we typically we do request and require that the quoters submit um, either a copy of the full catalog or a link to where the catalog can be found so that we can verify the pricing and we know specifically what version of the catalog they are using. And it eliminates a lot of back and forth, um, asking for clarification, um, eliminates us using older versions of catalogs when we're you know, looking at the most up-to-date pricing. The other thing that you wanna look at um, are the, uh, when you're talking about ancillary services, design, project management, and installation, you want to look at um, the GSA MAS approved hourly rates that are in the contractor's terms and conditions. So to do that, you go to eLibrary, you look up your, your contractor, you look up their hourly rates that are in their terms and conditions and make sure that they are at least as the same or less than what is um, approved in their GSA terms and conditions. So if somebody's terms and conditions say $50 an hour for this particular service and they're quoting you $49 an hour, on the quote they provided to you, that's fine. If they say $50 an hour, um, but their GSA terms and conditions say that their approved rate is 45, well, then you have a reason to go back to them through your discussions and say, hey, there seems to be a discrepancy here. Can you enlighten me as to where you found, um, you know, where you got this, this pricing from? So you definitely want to check that um, against the terms and conditions. The one other thing you want to look at in the terms and conditions on eLibrary are the discount percentages. Um, one of the advantages of awarding against an established BPA is that they very often include discounts that are higher than what is found on the vendor's GSA mass contract and listed in the terms and conditions. It's one of the you know, uh, points in the competition that has often um, identified one awardee over another is the discount percentages. So if you're awarding against a, a BPA, you are most likely will find discount percentages that are higher than what's on GSA mass contract. If not, if you're just going against schedules, you also want to just make sure that the discount percentage is equal to or greater than. And we encourage everybody, um, you know, if you're not using a BPA, there's nothing stopping you from asking the vendors for an additional discount above and beyond what they um, their GSA contract requires. They could say no, but it doesn't hurt to ask. You never know what the answer is going to be. So I'd encourage everybody to um, take that extra step and just in your RFQ say the government is seeking additional discounts and see what they come back with because you might end up getting a couple extra dollars off the price of your um, project. Um, if you um, look at the bottom of the, of the slide here, um, as Bart alluded to our timetable, we're at evaluation, only our initial round of evaluations, and we're already at four months into the procurement. This doesn't even um, take into account if you need to go back out for discussions to ask for clarifications, make some changes to the statement of work, whatever the case may be, and get revised quotes from your contractor. So just keep an eye on that timeline at the bottom and realize that um, you know this is best case scenario, but in all likelihood, it might take you a little bit more time than what you see on there. Um, one other thing I want to mention, and Jim mentioned it when he was talking earlier, is you got to check the math when you're doing a price evaluation because it's there could be errors. There could be human errors. There's a lot of formulas, but there's also a lot of cut and paste or keying in of numbers. So you definitely wanna make sure that the math is correct. Um, again, as I mentioned before, because sometimes these awards do come down to price. Um, 
you know, again, we very rarely make a ward on the initials. You could have one or two or three rounds of discussions that includes letters being sent to the vendors telling them what they need to fix, where they might be missing information, where you need clarification. And, um, you know, the discussions are held up until that point where you finally get somebody who is technically acceptable. So again, you want to um, build that extra time for discussions into your timeline as well. Okay, then you go through that, you have your initial evaluations, you have however many rounds of discussions you need to have to get to the point where you make an award decision. Ultimately, it's a contracting officer um, who is on the hook for determining the awardee, but it truly is based on a lot of contributing factors, a lot of contributing people, um, including the technical team, the team that looks at pricing. You're also gonna consider past performance as Jim alluded to earlier. Um, you know, so we've got, when we do a project, um, whether it's against a BPA or if it's to award a BPA, there's probably anywhere from, could be anywhere from six to 10 people who have a role in, in doing the evaluations and getting to that point where you can make an award decision. So there's a lot of people involved. The level of approvals um, pre-award would depend on what your agency requires. So I would encourage you to check with your agency and see. Um, a lot of that might depend on the type of contract vehicle used, the dollar value of the contract, the level of visibility. If it's a high, high visibility project, um, a lot of people might want to have a little input there. So you definitely want to check and see what, um, what it is that your agency requires prior to you um, pushing the button and making that award. Um, very important that everything is documented in the contract file. You also want to make sure you notify the unsuccessful quoters that they weren't selected. You need to let them know who was selected and the price at which their award was made. Um, if you give that information, a lot of times they'll, um, you know, kind of just drop it at that, especially if you tell them you were technically acceptable. However, decision was made based on price. The awardee's price was this yours was that, and it's pretty cut and dry that it came down to price. Um, you could get a request for follow-up uh, information or a debrief from the unsuccessful offerers. So be prepared to respond to those requests. And the recommendation would be to put everything in writing because um, you wanna make sure that there's a record of what was asked and how it was answered just in case for whatever reason, a, a, a unsuccessful offerer wants to um, wants to launch a protest on your decision. You wanna make sure that you have all your ducks in a row and everything is well documented. And you need to play that fine line between giving them the information that they want, but not giving them too much information. So the other consideration there too, is if you get in that situation, consult with your legal department and make sure that you're saying enough, but not saying too much when it comes to answering those questions. As far as, um, you know, once the award is made, that's the point in time when the funds are obligated by the government to the contractor. So the warranted uh, CO is going to be the one who, like I said, pushes the button, puts the signature on the award document and sets things in motion. And um, if you look at the timeline again at the bottom, we left about a month for the award process. I would say that once you make a determination of who your awardee is, Probably give yourself um, three to four weeks to finish your award memo, go through your review process, you know, have your legal team review just to make sure, prepare your award and ultimately make the award. So it's not you decide on Thursday and your award on Friday. There's a little bit more time that's required in there to really to get all your ducks in a row. But again, right now, even at this point, we're looking at five months um, and that's probably um, on the conservative side. Once you make that award, then it's time for the design process and the process for the final bill of materials to begin. So this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of you seeing your project come to fruition and become a reality. You're gonna to wanna to hold a kickoff meeting with including your own team, your customer, your contractor, any of the local dealers that they will have involved in their project. Um, I believe Jim described um, that process earlier. You're going to want to kind of introduce all the parties whose roles and responsibilities for different things. Most likely, um, your customer will have CAD file and other electronic files that they can share with the contractor to get them started. Um, and, you know, any kind of drawings or site surveys that kind of give a lay of the land in terms of the space that they're working in. Uh, during the process, you're absolutely going to want to have your furniture vendor make a site visit to the location, um, that's really where they get a look and they do final field measurements and make sure that 
you know, something wasn't moved in construction, there's no column now where you thought it was an open room or, you know, there's not a space for a higher fire hydrant where you thought you were going to load up some filing cabinets. You need to really let your contractor take a look at that because during this process is when they're going to look at the plans, look at the furniture requirements and basically see if the two fit with each other. They're going to make recommendations for changes. Maybe something's a tight fit or it doesn't really um, go well in that area, but they're going to work with your customer, with you and your customer to basically get your design um, to the point where it's ready for them to produce a final bill of materials. Included in that process is choosing your fabrics and finishes. And I know that one of the questions earlier um, was, do we, when we go out with an RFQ, do we allow them to give us the gamut of what they have to offer? and then make a decision in the design process or do we narrow it down during the RFQ? And to that, the answer would be that you kind of give them um, an idea in the RFQ of, we're looking for a mid-grade fabric or we want a fabric grade of six or this type of finish, but then you hone in on that at this design process to basically come to your ultimate decisions. Um, you have to think of things like who in your organization or in the customer's organization needs to be involved in making that decision. Um, last thing you want to do is spend two or three weeks looking at colors and fabrics and finishes and then have somebody come down from the fifth floor and say, no, we're not going with that. Um, you want to make sure that everybody's involved that needs to be involved. One consideration as well, and we've run into this with some of our projects, is there needs to be union consideration um, in terms of fabrics or finishes and other design aspects of your project. So if, there's a, if you're working with the union, um, make sure that they're involved in the conversation because you don't want to get so far along and have to turn back because you didn't touch base with what the union, um, the part of the process that they need to play. Again, all of that needs to get factored into your, um, your timeline. Once you have all that settled, then the contractor is going to develop a final bill of materials. They will work with you to update the statement of work as necessary. In our case, if we do a project, the statement of work with changes comes back to Carlos and Dawn and their team, and they make all the changes that need to have, we need to have happen on that document because we need that statement of work to reflect exactly what it is that the customer wants. Because the final bomb is going to come back and hopefully reflect exactly what it is that the customer wants. And then we're going to go through that process again. We're going to do another technical evaluation like Laura had talked about. We're going to do another price evaluation, like I had mentioned, to make sure that everything is where it needs to be, given any changes that may have happened during design. And then at that point in time, we're going to award that final bill of materials. From that final bill of materials, then the order goes into production at the manufacturer. And that's really when your, your furniture product starts to be made. Because um, I believe, as Jim had mentioned earlier, it's not just off the shelf, run into a warehouse, get 75 desks, 45 chairs and whatever. They custom make what it is that you're ordering to your specifications and that takes time. And um, as we're gonna talk about in a second, it's taking more time than we would like it to take given uh, the current state of affairs with supply chain. So you need to take all of that into consideration. So we're talking manufacturing, delivery and installation. Again, your timeline needs to account for the time it takes to make or produce the furniture. Um, and as we've all mentioned, the lead times are a very fluid situation right now. In the past, you could estimate six to eight weeks manufacturing lead time. Up until a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at anywhere from maybe eight to 16 weeks. Um, recently, even in the past couple of days, we're hearing um, anywhere for some items up to 34 weeks of manufacturing lead time, which put really you know, could put a real wrinkle into your project and your timeline. Um, a lot of that is unpredictable. There's it, a lot of it is out of our control, but you just need to be aware and be in constant communication with your selected awardee in terms of how, how are things working as far as their manufacturing lead times go. Um, again, a lot of that is out of control, but it's definitely an influencing factor. One other thing you need to consider is um, risks for the delivery and installation schedule is you're looking at potential labor shortages um, and then also site conditions, which might affect the uh, installation. Again, some stuff that is, is out of everybody's control given the current state of affairs, but it's just things that you need to consider as you um, work through this process. As you can see at the timeline on the bottom, we're up to about 10 months. And that's kind of like a best case scenario with, um, I think when we put this together, we were at about a 16 week lead time. 
So we might want to extend that baby blue color out a couple more blocks there because we have found that the time um, manufacturing time is taking us is taking a bit longer now, um, just given to supply chain issues. And then really that's kind of where you are, you know, when you, it boils down to it, you get to the installation. Um, I believe Jim talked about, you know, install and dealing with punch list items and having representatives there from your agency to walk through and, you know, find out any things that need to be fixed or addressed or, or whatever. That's, you know, kind of where we are now. And really, you know, we've learned lessons along the way. Um, I've learned lots of lessons along the way since starting with GSA and, and working with furniture. But I think the issue is really to communicate, have those open lines of communication with your contractors, know what their lead times are about, um, know what they're looking at in terms of fabrics and finishes. How are they doing? Um, another thing that Jim had mentioned with security clearances, if your facility requires a security clearance for the installers, make sure you communicate that up front so they can start that process. Um, even, you know, as the design process is starting or as early as possible to give yourselves time for people to go through the background checks that they need to go through. Realize that any changes in your requirements are gonna cause delays in the process. Um, switching a color, wanting a different fabric. Uh, I'm not quite sure I like how the one office is laid out. Let's see if we can move it around a little bit. All of that is gonna add to your timeline. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's why it's really important in looking at you know, what Jim talked about and Carlos with requirements and, and, and Laura, that you really, really have the best control you can have over your requirements. Understanding things are going to happen, but the more you can have it solidified, the better off you're going to be. Um, realize that the design process, you might get your selections, you know, made, but the contractor requires time to develop that final bill of materials. They can't turn it around overnight. So um, show a little patience when you're working with them in that process. And as best you can, I think we've all said it all along, just build in time and try to be flexible because um, like I said, there's a lot of this that is out of anybody's control and um, you know, everybody's doing the best that they can to keep everything on track as much as possible. I think our next, we've just got a couple of um, websites, I think, and resources for folks to look at. If you have any questions, there's some links there. So when you get the um, presentation, You'll have the links available. And if all else fails, use that email at furniture at gsa.gov. I believe that goes to our business development team. And um, Jim and the team in, in BD will, um, you know, take a look at your questions. If they can't answer them, then they'll get them to those of us, you know, who, who might have the answers. And we will definitely do the research and get back to you um, to help you out. And I think, Laura, I think we're set, right? Perfect. Well, thank yes, you guys. Thank you. That was such great information. I really, uh, I, I think seeing that graph at the bottom where you went through the timeline was very helpful. It helped tie all of it together. So thank you for that graphic. I think that always helps. Um, let's see if we have a couple of questions here. Um, I know we've been, we have John that's been helping us answer the questions live and he's been- He has been a rock star. He's huh, been doing such a great job. So we don't yes. have to go through, but um, I'm going to ask one, I think it's more geared for Carlos, but we'll see if he's online or if somebody else is online that can help answer this. Um, let's see, just to clarify, it was stated by Carlos that IWAC does not provide design services, but PBS can support or the agency can procure these professional services on mass. Is that correct? So uh, let me let me reread that. Just to clarify, it was stated by Carlos that IWAC does not provide design services, but GSA's public building service can, or the agency can procure these professional services on multiple work schedules. Is that correct? And then there's that, some follow on. Sure, that is correct. Um, IWAC does not do the design portion of that. However, uh, PBS, if you are leasing space through them or if you're leasing or if you're in a federal building, I believe that their designers can assist you on that. And yes, there is MAS, uh, a route to do that in there. And I think okay. that'll be in the slideshow when they when they get it. Perfect. So two different directions they can take. One is through, it sounds like one through our public building service portion of GSA if they're in a GSA space. The second is through the multiple award schedules program, sounds like, and more information on that will be provided, it sounds like. And um, Carlos, I don't know if you have this information off the top of your head. If not, we will get this 
for for the audience, but um, what is the SEN or the special item number under the multiple award schedule? So what area can people go to find that? What SEN? That is a great question. I do not have that number. Okay. I think someone on here probably should have that number. <laughs> okay. I think Laura might be trying to, oh, I, I thought she was trying to unmute. You know, Dana, I think the other the other place, oh, Annette, hey, do you know the SIN? I guess is the question, um, the SIN for office furniture? Is that what the question is? For design services, I think. Oh, design, oh, well, I'm gonna back off on that one. I, don't, I know office <laughs> furniture, I don't know design. I have no to worries, well, See if John we, actually, is, is it John on the slide? I think it might be on there, the slide. There is that, some of that information. The other thing is, <laughs> This presentation is going to be available after the event, so we will make sure everybody has a copy of it with all the links. But if you don't want to navigate that by yourself, we have an entire network of customer service directors that are out there that can help you get to the place that you need to be with questions like this. The Furniture Center and the IWAC Center are amazing and they work with you directly as well. So please use the resources that are in the presentation but also feel free to work out, um, you know, reach out to your customer service director. I'm looking at the chat right now to see, I know Kelly has been great about posting the customer service director locator. Um, they're available. And if you can't find them that way, you can always email us at the events team. We'll make sure that they, uh, the information gets to the right person. We won't leave you hanging. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and this is a bit of a follow on to that same question. Uh, is there a list of points of contact for that public building service? So those the people that uh, run the GSA buildings for their interior designers by region. Does anybody happen to have that? And again, if not, we will have this information posted to the Q&A uh, after the event. But just didn't know if anybody has that on hand that they can share. I don't, Dana, but I did find the category number for the Comprehensive Furniture Management Services. I popped it into the chat, but it's category 541614CF, as in Frank. Perfect. Thank you. And you guys can all see that in the chat. And again, all of these answers will be posted to the website after the event. So, so Dana, I have a couple of things. Um, I, I found the NAICS codes. If, if okay. folks want them. Now, I should preface this by saying these are the two we use most commonly. They're not, you know, catch-alls. They might not always be appropriate, particularly if the if the requirement is very narrow defined, narrowly defined. Uh, one is three three seven two one one for wood office furniture, and the other, and the other is probably more commonly used is actually three three seven two one four for metal office furniture. I also want to make a, a caveat about. Uh, support or design support through PBS. You know, th that's not something they do um, for non-tenant agencies. So you would have to be a tenant of public building service. And they would provide that design through a couple of different mechanisms. But generally speaking, the, the, leasing, the leasing specialist working with that agency would be the best person to contact to get the designer's information. Okay, perfect. And again, if anybody has any follow-up questions, um, Mary informed us about the, the customer service director, that CSD network, or again, always feel free to email anybody listed on the presentations or even the events team, and we will get all those questions answered for you if, um, if we have an answer to the, to the uh, level that you need. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Mary for a quick poll. And again, thank you. Thank you, Lauren, and that great job, great information, really tied in great with the rest of the, of the presentations that we've seen today. So Mary, back over to you. Thank you, Dana. Actually, this is a poll, but it's a multiple choice. And we want you to really though only choose the one that you think might be absolutely the right answer. So it's a quiz based on what Laura and Annette told you. So, on average, an assisted acquisition furniture project will take how many months from planning, design, to delivery install? And I have 35% right now. I can tell there are some very engaged people answering. We're going to give it just a couple of more seconds. Keep going. I got to get over my 50%, guys. 
We're at 50, yay. I'll give it two more seconds. Okay, and I'm gonna share the results. Nine to 12 months, 56% of you. I think that time bar on the bottom, guys, was a great way, and that Laura, to let people know. It does take a little while, and um, that's a generalization, but really good information uh, that you guys were paying attention. I'm gonna stop sharing that now. And I really wanna say, you guys, all of you audience members and all of our presenters, thank you so much for awesome participation. Um, I am now going to introduce Mr. Ryan Schrank. He is the director of the organization we've been hearing about all day today, a lot, the Integrated Workplace Acquisition Center or the IWAC Center. He's gonna wrap up the furniture portion of this conference. And then we're gonna have a little treat after that for all of you, if you'll just stick around. Ryan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. As Mary said, my name is Ryan Schrank, and I'm the director of the Integrated Workplace Acquisition Center, and several of our team members provided the presentations today. So before everyone heads for the virtual exits, just want to send my thanks to all of you for taking the time to join us today. I know we hit you with the fire hose of information, most of which is geared towards helping you get your furniture requirements off the ground and taking the necessary planning actions before you move towards the solicitation phase. Hopefully these sessions better prepared you for your current or future needs. And there's just something I wanna reiterate that Dina made in her earlier remarks. The entire case network and the IWAC team, we're here to provide you that support throughout the process. So as you move forward, if you have questions about today's training, you're developing your requirements, you have questions about GSA product offerings, you're in your evaluation process or anything else related to your agency's furniture needs, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us at furniture at gsa.gov and whatever your question is, we're gonna connect you to the right person to help you out. In addition, I know many of you uh, are representing agencies where your core mission isn't buying furniture. If you're finding it difficult to prioritize your furniture or office management requirements with your core mission, reach out to us uh, again and we could see if our IWAC projects team has capacity to provide you support and take it on your assisted acquisition for your furniture needs. Capacities with our project branch definitely ebbs and flows based on agency requests and needs. But if that's something of interest to you, we can definitely uh, have a discussion and reach out again at furniture at gsa.gov. At a minimum, our team can at least provide consultative and advisory support for your requirements and help you get on track. And I also just want to shine a light uh, briefly on our Quality Partnership Council, or QPC, which Jim mentioned earlier in his presentation. Our QPC is focused on creating stronger relationships between government and industry. And I saw several questions during the presentations about market trends, especially as we navigate through this whole post-COVID workplace and understanding what that's going to look like, more collaboration, higher walls, things like that. And also Annette touched on industry challenges with supply chain issues. During our twice-year QPC session, we discuss these types of topics, current events impacting the furniture marketplace, both from the government and from industry perspective. So hopefully the next time we meet in the future, you're able to join us. And if you're interested, please reach out at qpc at gsa.gov. And lastly, I just want to take time to thank all of our presenters today. Working closely with the team, I know much how much thought, time, and consideration they put into the content for today. So I hope you all found it valuable. So thanks again, Dina, Jim Boyle, Carlos Barrera, Chris Stein, Gaines Robinson, Annette Lang, and Laura Taddy for supporting this event. In addition, I wanna give a huge thanks to the CASE team for facilitating these events. We always appreciate the opportunity and the forum to connect with our customers and industry partners and CASE always gives us a place to do that. So thanks again to Bill Toth, Marie Krukerl, Dana Fairley for their support throughout the process with planning this event. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Marie and the CASE team to wrap up today's session. Thanks again for being here. Thank you, Ryan. Very nice words. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, well, up next, um, I have Mr. Bill Toth, our Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Customer and Stakeholder Engagement the home of all this event's team and all of the customer facing functions that work to add value to your experience with the Federal Acquisition Service. He will close out our day today. 
So Bill, take it away. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and, and thank you, Ryan, for the partnership. And thanks to all of you for attending our event today on building furniture requirements. Uh, well, this is our final FAST 2022 series event. You can rest assured we're busy planning our series for FY23. Just think the, there's a lot of great value in these conference events. Not only have you heard the latest and greatest on furniture and furnishings, but today we brought together agencies, acquisition and program professionals, as well as industry partners for this collaborative time together. It's our goal to provide you with the tools that help you find the right people in GSA and FAS who can answer your questions or guide you through solutions. We wanna drive awareness of online resources, provide contracting insights and innovative ideas, and allow you to save time when working on requirements. Our goal is to make requirements development easier for you. Additionally, this conference allowed industry to hear firsthand some of the business challenges and pain points you're facing. I know these are priceless insights for industry. I was thrilled about the level of participation today. Great feedback in the polls, engagement in the Q&A and chat boxes. Um, it really was great. But I have just a couple other things for you before you leave. Um, one thing I'd like you to take on as an action item today, uh, it relates to what I said. We we're beginning to work um, on our upcoming training conferences for next fiscal year. And we're eager to, eager to hear ideas from you, uh, any insights or thoughts uh, that you have. And so if you have some ideas, please do email us. Um, the email would be fast.event at gsa.gov. I'll say that again for you, fast.event at gsa.gov. Uh, we'd love to get your input and, and insights into um, you know, what we might produce for FY23. And we can't wait to see you uh, during our FY23 series. So one more ask for you. If you haven't already, I encourage you to go to gsa.gov forward slash fast. When you're there, you hit subscribe now and you'll be the first to know about our FY23 conference series. We'll keep you in the loop on our schedule and our upcoming trainings. And so again, gsa.gov forward slash fast, and you'll be uh, first to know about our future trainings. Really appreciate your time, your energy, and your participation. Thank you so much for, for partnering with us, and I will turn it back over to Mary. Thanks, Bill. In closing out, I want to thank everybody again for joining us today. I will turn the back over turn the floor back over to my co-host, Dana Fairley, for a few final notes and reminders. Dana? Thank you, Mary. I would like to thank you all for taking the time to join us for today's event. I would also like to invite you to return, like Bill said, to the gsa.gov forward slash FAST website, where you can download a PDF copy of today's presentations. They're available now. Q&As will be posted to the event, as well as a wealth of other information that's related to the event that you just went, that you just you know took the time uh, to participate in today. CLPs will be issued out to attendees via email within the next three weeks. We sincerely hope you will join us for our next sessions in FY23. Please remember to subscribe on the webpage to be the first to hear of the future events. Thank you guys so much and have a great rest of your day. Again, thank you. Take care. <laughs>